talking LinkedIn tips for job seekers, but also everybody. Okay. So LinkedIn is one of those things that is fun. It's fun to network, but it's also kind of a necessary evil. If you are truly networking at a professional level, you have to have a LinkedIn profile. So the question is why, why? Well, I'll tell you. So LinkedIn has 660 plus million users. That's a lot. But the bigger statistic that you want to be thinking about is whether you currently are employed or you're looking for your next opportunity, 87% of recruiters use LinkedIn um, to check on candidates. So they're pulling up your profile and you can see here the other social media mechanisms that they are looking at, um, including Facebook as well as Twitter. So if you are in the market for a position, which you never know when that might be, uh, think about those things that you're posting on Facebook and Twitter. Um, maybe don't pick something so divisive, but hey, it's it, it could be your personal outlet. That's cool. Just know that recruiters do check it out. So very important to be thinking about what you're posting, but more importantly for LinkedIn to have that completed profile. So let's talk about the profile. So a lot of people think that they can just copy and paste their resume into their LinkedIn profile. And that's not exactly the case. So the resume is really focused on responsibilities and LinkedIn should really be focused more on accomplishments. It's actually telling the story of your brand through LinkedIn. So with resumes, you're talking about you were responsible for this, this and this. You have the bullets that always include a number um, to quantify what you were responsible for. And you also want to include numbers and um, measures of uh, metrics of measurement in your accomplishments on LinkedIn. But you also want it to be told more as a story, not as a list. So talk about what you're passionate about, what you're proud of. You can also use for, uh, the first person because you're really giving the story of your experience and your accomplishments. And you can also be personable. You can talk about the things that really energize you from a career perspective. The other thing is a lot of people think if they cram it with keywords, almost to the point where it's unreadable, that that will help the searchability in LinkedIn. And that's not always the case because you don't want to just be pulled up for every job or every recruiter that's looking for a loss prevention executive, you want to be pulled up for the job position that you want the most. So let's take a look at um, when you're thinking about the job you want the most, you take a look at the job description and, and, and the different things that it would be responsible for. Those are the keywords that you want to weave in a logical way into your profile. So you really want to look at maybe your dream job that you found in the job description and work backwards from there to be able to put those into LinkedIn. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is kind of my soapbox. <laughs> so everyone's all going to go pull up my picture now on LinkedIn and probably give me some feedback and that's okay. But the, your picture is really a very important part of your LinkedIn profile. It's not about being vain, unfortunately, Words say a lot or pictures say a lot more than words when you're looking at uh, a candidate to fill a potential role or if just someone that you might think is uh, a perfect fit for your network. So here's a couple points. Look approachable, right? You don't want to be 50 feet away from the camera. You also don't want to have sunglasses on, maybe a hat that's covering your head. Um, no other people in the picture is really kind of a LinkedIn rule. I know your boo is really sweet. You love that person, but not really uh, appropriate for a professional LinkedIn photo. The other thing you've seen, which is a little crazy, is the arm, the suspect arm kind of draped over uh, the shoulder there. They, the, then they cut out the other person. No, you probably don't want to do that. You also need to, to be uh, up to date. They say the saying is if your LinkedIn picture is old enough to buy a drink, might be time to update it. So I'm almost getting there actually. So have that up to date picture um, so people can really, especially if they're going to meet you at a trade show or a conference or whatnot, that they would say, oh yeah, that's Amber. I know her from her picture. You also need to look the part. So if you love fishing and you picture is you on a fishing boat, um, Probably not, unless you're going for a fishing career, 
right? So you want to look the part about what job that you are um, seeking. And this is really for people that already are employed or might be looking for another opportunity at some point. So it, remember, it's not a Facebook picture. This is a picture that should be professional, um, not for your friends. It's really a different type of tone. Also not a selfie, right? Uh, I, we see a lot of the pictures where the folks like in a car, maybe they just got their hair done and they want to take a picture of it in the car with the seatbelt on. Probably not uh, the greatest backdrop to have in your picture. So no selfies in the car. Um, also, the other point is don't overdo Photoshop. We all want to look a little bit younger um, in our pictures on Facebook and LinkedIn. However, overdoing the Photoshop is just probably not a great idea. Now, everyone asks me um, a lot of times, like, what is the size of a LinkedIn picture? Because you don't want it to look grainy and pixelated. You want it to really be clear um, and frame nicely in the LinkedIn portion. So here's how you know that your picture should be 400 pixels wide by 400 tall, okay? So um, you can make sure that that is that size, especially if you go to a professional photographer and you let them know that you would like to have a, a LinkedIn picture of that size. Uh, they can set it up for you and make sure that it's a perfect resolution. Uh, other cheat sheet, uh, when you're looking at all of your different social media outlets and graphics and pictures to, to post that go along with them, a perfect cheat sheet is Social Media Examiner. If you go on Google, just Google Social Media Examiner Ultimate Guide to Social Media Images will give you all the up-to-date sizes because they're constantly changing of what you want to use for LinkedIn and your other social media outlets. So very important. Okay, now we're going to specifically talk to job seekers, whether you're currently seeking a job or you will at some point. I mean, everybody's living their dream job right now, but that might not always be the case. So here's some tips um, for those that are currently unemployed in your profile, in your headline, not a great idea to put unemployed or seeking new opportunities. What you want to do is focus on the job that you want or your experience that you've had and use that loss prevention executive or a safety expert or um, risk management leader. You can use all of these types of words to describe your experience in your headline without saying um, seeking a new opportunity or unemployed. You also want to use the summary section to describe your accomplishments um, and then end with if you could benefit from a skill set like mine, please contact me, right? So sometimes people have their LinkedIn profile set where you can't automatically contact them. And one of the things that you always should do is put your contact information in the summary part so anyone can see how to contact you. So the other good point would be to reach out to recruiters in, in your area and connections that may help you network um, and this is really important because you're not reaching out to just say, hey, you got a job opening for me. You're building a connection. You're building a relationship. And this could help you even if you're currently employed um, to start doing that just because the most valuable way to network is a concept really coined by Bob Littell years ago called net weaving. And then the whole premise of net weaving is to really focus on what you can do for your network. How can I help my network? Uh, and that means you may not be a right fit for a job role, or you may not even be looking, but you may know someone. And if you can help recruiters place uh, the open roles that they have, they're going to be totally more apt to uh, connect with you and want to network with you because you're truly, sincerely uh, looking at how you can help other people, um, not just uh, kind of the what's in it for me all the time type of attitude. And that truly is a very important concept called net weaving. Um, you can check that out on netweavinginternational.com. They've got some uh, principles there. Very important. So you should also, as we're talking about, focus on creating relationships. Important that when you go to connect with someone, add a note. Add that note. You don't just want to hit the connect button, which is sometimes difficult because LinkedIn tricks you. If you're looking at it on your phone and it says you might know these people and you hit the connect button, it won't give you the opportunity to send a message. But you really want to send that message um, when you're connecting with people. A great idea, especially if you've met them, 
in person or through a mutual acquaintance via email and then you go connect with them on LinkedIn, say, hey, it's so-and-so, We I met you through or I met you at this particular event. Very important to give people context and also reminds them that you remembered them in a very sincere way. So uh, when you're also looking for the recruiters or other folks in your area that can help you, you use advanced search. You can search by title. You can also search by geography. Um, and when you're reaching out and send that note to those recruiters, you know, the note isn't, hey, got any openings as we've talked about. It's would love to help you fill any roles you might have open. Do you have 10 minutes to chat? Um, and, you know, have the right expectations to think about what you can do to help them. Um, and and really understand and learn what their challenges are. And, and in turn, that'll build value in your brand and also help you understand um, how to continue to network with this person and what they find valuable. So have your elevator speech at the ready. When you meet with recruiters or any really new connection, no one wants to hear your life story, unfortunately. So you really want to make sure that you're hitting the highlights in a very succinct way. And, and we just crafted this one very quick. You know, um, hi, I'm Amber Bradley, a marketing branding um, expert. I'm particularly adept at messaging and uh, creating an, an unprecedented marketing campaigns. So, so you have a quick 30-second look at a snippet of who you are, what you do, and what your most proudest ac accomplishments are. And then you can move the conversation to that person asking questions about you if they are interested. Clearly, if they don't ask any more questions about you, um, you can move on. But have that elevator speech ready for your most important highlights, because as the saying says, you only get one chance to make a first impression. So you want that to be very uh, packed with value and uh, shows the person that you are uh, someone that values their time and understanding uh, what they want to hear from you. So these were some very quick tips on LinkedIn. Now we're going to turn to Dave Johnston from Duncan Brands and Rob Holm from McDonald's to talk to us about what their LinkedIn tips might be, but also what they're looking for in a fantastic candidate to fill any roles that they have. All right, guys. Now we're going to turn it to the real experts living and breathing this every day. <laughs> Rob Holm and Dave Johnston, welcome. Welcome to the Think Tank. Okay, so the audience just heard my tips on LinkedIn, but now we're going to throw it to you, starting with you, Dave Johnston. So what, what thoughts do you have about really the best use of LinkedIn or why you should be on LinkedIn or your whole thoughts on how people should connect on LinkedIn? Yeah, you know, as you'd mentioned, LinkedIn is all about networking. It's about connecting with people and, and connecting is not just about trying to get the number of people you can have in your connection profile, right? It's, it's about the true connections because, you know, networking should be something you continue to build throughout your career. It's something you want to have before you need it. So for me, it's connecting with people that I have a true connection with. And when I go and look for a new connection, it's trying to make that personal connection, adding a note. What did I learn from them? Did I see a post that was interesting? Somebody they follow and to connect with them with that shared experience so that we're starting the, the, the we're starting our connection with the foundation of, you know, for me, importantly, for giving before getting. Uh, and that's the key for me. All right, Rob, over to you. Oh, that, was, that was good, Dave. Um, the only thing I would add to that is it, when people are trying to connect with you, it's so important to me that there's a picture that goes with it. Um, not too often, you know, they're taking the time to try to make that connection and they're using this as a professional way to make um, engagement happen. Uh, it's always best to start with a face instead of some blank icon. Uh, and then what is their interest in connecting? What is it that truly driving them to reach out to me? What What is it that caused them to do so? And what is their interest so that I can make sure that I'm prepared to be able to return that favor back to them? Yeah, that blank connection note is so impersonal. It makes me always go to their profile to be like, do I even know this person? Like, how does it work? So definitely the note is crucial from what I'm hearing for sure. And uh, 
that whole concept of net weaving is such a big deal. Um, okay, so our audience really wants to get to both of you executives at Global Brands and kind of talking about what do you really see or what do you look for in uh, candidates coming into your organizations? Um, so we're gonna start off with the main characteristics that you look for in a candidate. It could be on the resume, it could be just characteristics off the resume. Like what do you guys feel like are some of the most important things you look for in that process? Rob, we'll go to you first. Yeah, you know, Amber, what I've learned throughout my career as a people manager is really the importance for any new hire is fitting in well with the team. Hiring the best candidate with the most impressive job history, experience, and skills won't mean a thing if he or she isn't able to fit in with your team. So therefore, complementing the existing chemistry of the team weighs heavy on my hiring decision. So what I look for that may not be on the resume is the candidate a team player? Uh, during college, did they participate in extracurricular activities such as sports, student council, band, et cetera? And then have they demonstrated team-oriented behaviors? A person who puts the good of the team ahead of personal gain or recognition. If I don't assess the candidate's propensity to teamwork, uh, the star candidate might easily turn out to be a bad hire. Yeah, good points there for sure. Okay, Dave? Yeah, team orientation, you know, the ability to be a good player on, on the team is important. It's also about the other soft skills, you know, the ability to communicate and adapt uh, and, and even changing in this fast paced environment. Uh, you know, the soft skills often can't be found or learned via the resume, but you can definitely pull them out in the interview process. You know, that's where I think the candidate has the greatest opportunity to highlight these skills. And it's really how the candidate talks about their experience and their knowledge and they bringing up these soft skills that help us to, uh, to really identify what they can do. You know, it's the candidate who catches my attention is often not the person who is just talking about their accomplish, accomplishments, but they bring into the discussion how they've utilized certain skills. And I'll give you a, a quick example. You know, a candidate won't impress me all day with their talk about how their success rate is so high in interviews or investigations. You know, you can talk to me all day about numbers and admissions and success stories, um, but that won't separate you from somebody else. What will impress me is the candidate who, while discussing their interviewing and in, in interviewing and investigative skills, talks about a particular situation where they may have failed or experienced a challenge during an investigation bringing out what did they learn, how did they adapt, and how did it make them better the next time. That helps to identify skills that you won't see on a resume. No, that's fantastic uh, advice. And something that you typically don't think of, right? When you're thinking about putting your best foot forward and wanting to make sure that you appear as the perfect candidate, you know, I always love when people, they throw the question out, well, what's your greatest weakness, right? Sure. And most people say, oh, it's my perfectionism. I just try to be too perfect. I try to be too perfect at everything, right? Um, so you're saying, I think that's a great point, that it's okay to talk about maybe a time that you didn't live up to your own expectations and that you learned from that. So, But now turning the tables a bit. Um, okay, so Dave, we're going to go back to you. What was a time that you asked a question and you immediately got an answer that you were like, okay, maybe this person is not the best fit for our team. And it might, you can't use the perfectionism, no. <laughs> the greatest weakness one, but you know, that's always an interesting thing to me because you're trying to do so much, assess so many things about a person in such a short time from an interview conversation or a few interviews, right? So what's one thing that you were just like, that wasn't a great answer? Well, you know, I could take the easy way out and tell you that, you know, we asked them to name three Starbucks coffees or three McDonald's breakfast uh, items. And if they if they can name all six, then we don't want them. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's but, great. Uh, but 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 I won't do that there. Uh, you know, there's really not a single question for me, but I, I think one that will get will definitely get a candidate a demerit is when you know and, and we try to ask them to tell us a little bit something that they found interesting about duncan as they research their position or the company for the role you know i'm a strong believer in preparation especially when it comes to 
you know, here's a person seeking an opportunity that wants to work for, for our brand. And there's so much information available today through the internet to be able to research a company or, you know, even a director or, or, or a person in the department um, that the candidates really should have that information in their back pocket and be prepared to ask that. Uh, and, and, you know, if we can ask them to tell us a little bit of something about what they learned about the business or the department and they can't, are they really interested in being part of the Duncan team or are they just interested in getting a job? Oh, good points. Good points. It's almost like having that question at the ready, right? Isn't that weird when you say to the candidate, do you have any questions for me? And they're, thinking about a life altering change here and they go, nah, not really. <laughs> okay, Rob, we'll go over to you. Hey, you going back to what you said earlier, Amber, about the weakness question, that honestly is one that's always stumbled me. I mean, because again, exposing the vulnerability to someone who I just met, who I'm trying to impress by representing myself as the best candidate for the job, Come on, I mean, who really wants to say, hey, I, I got this weakness, you know? So, but but I do see value in ans asking that question. So I, I've i kind of turned it around a little bit. Um, and so so I asked the interview, as the interview, I ask it like, we're all human. We all make mistakes. So tell me about an example where you made a mistake. Well, I was interviewing a candidate. I asked him that question. I tell him to take his time. He answered it saying, I really can't recall any mistake that I've ever made. And I go professionally or personally, it doesn't matter. Professionally or personally, just tell me about a mistake you've ever made and then what you would have done differently if given a chance. I said, I, you know, I'm thinking he's nervous, he's anxious. Just give him, just take your time, answer the question. He paused. He goes, honestly, I honestly can't think of a time where I made a mistake. All right, Amber, at that point, I'm going, okay, this interview is basically over. I'm just going to go through the motions. And um, at the end of the interview, I was about to say, you know what? I think there is an opportunity here where if somebody was to ask you that question, you can now say you made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> did you say that? No, I didn't. Oh, Duncan. man, that would have been awesome. I did, I did tell that Duncan is my yeah, <laughs> he's such a cinema for today. <laughs> That's and, and interesting. Now you know why, and now you know how I got the job at Duncan. Rob didn't hire me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh my god! So yeah, that's really interesting because I think you're right. You know, a lot of people don't want to take that road, but if you you know think of it, and like you said, Dave, big preparation is key here. That you may think of the things because. If you're not super good on your feet, you know, you don't certainly want to tell them about the time that you had too much to drink and drove home or something, right? Not that kind of mistake, not a good idea. You want to have some at the ready, right? With some lessons that you learned. And I would, I would add to that, Amber, exactly right. And that's, to me, what I've learned throughout my career is really not at the heart of you making a mistake. What the heart of the question is, is for you to demonstrate humility. And that's what's a value that I believe is something that I've learned throughout my career is it's, it's okay to make a mistake, you know, and you learn from it, but, but also to be humble that we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. And yeah, you, yeah. you recognize that mistake and then you learn from it and you're going to get better because of it. Yeah. The ego is a killer, I think, you know, yeah. in, in pretty much all facets of life, but uh, certainly to this. Okay. Staying on topic. Uh, okay. Mr. J.C. Penney, I love the story. He is a famed retailer and he was known for not hiring people. So let me back up. He'd take them out to breakfast and if they would order their eggs, if they put salt on the food before tasting it, he was known not to hire them because he thought it, they were impulsive, right? Didn't even try the food before they salted it and, and even further, too much into a routine to change. So... Do you guys agree with this type of assessment that, you know, behavior in people's lives can be pretty, you know, apparent of how they will be as an employee? And and would you is there anything like that that you're like, man, you know, that 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 person probably won't be open to feedback or change? Like, what do you think is at the heart of that uh, assessment? So, Rob, I'm going to go to you on this one. So first off, 
Mr. Penny sounds just like my mom. <laughs> hey, I will order a pepper steak, which has been marinated and coated in pepper. And when they serve it to me, without even tasting it, I'll still add more pepper. I <laughs> love pepper. However, if there's somebody that puts ketchup on a hot dog, that person has a problem. I'm just telling you, be, especially in Chicago. <laughs> you know, on a, on, a, on a more serious note, um, you know, Mr. Penny was very successful. Obviously, it, that approach may have worked for him 100 years ago. But I re recently recall a candidate who was in his late 20s that came in for an interview who wasn't wearing socks. I consider myself old school and coming into an interview and not wearing socks, unthinkable. However, I realize fashion's changed and one needs to embrace those that are different from oneself. The more diverse your team, not just in gender or ethnicity, but diverse in background, thought, education, I submit to you will enable your team to be more of value to your organization. Yeah, really good points. All right, Dave, are you wearing socks for this interview? I, I am not wearing socks for this interview. You know, <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, you Just know, I've, I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've I've heard a story similar to the one with with Mr. Penny, and uh, and every person they have their their, their little nuances when it comes to interviewing. But uh, you know, I like Rob. I I definitely believe that it's not one single aspect of an individual, particularly during a singular event like an interview. Um, really gets to show a true assessment of, of a person. And, you know, in these days and times, you know, it's important to have that diversity um, and that difference, differing of opinions. And, and, you know, our interview process, you know, we're great. We utilize a variety of tools, video conferencing, team interviewing, different lines of questioning to the candidate, depending on if it's me talking to them or, or one of my management personnel. Because we think that having that diverse range of interviewing gives us the opportunity to learn the best we can about a candidate, um, their different environments, how they communicate at different levels, and even bringing out their individuality and their diversity um, helps us to understand the true fit. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love those answers. And what's so hard, as I said, you know, you're trying to assess people's a ton of different aspects of someone's personality and how they go to market with their own brand in a very short amount of time. So when you think about whatever position you're hiring for, it might not be uh, your highest level, might not be you know starting out with you, but thinking about assessing someone's strategic thinking, which you would think, you know, everybody talks about you hire the person, you can teach the skill later. Uh, which I think speaks directly to how that person thinks and what kind of person that they are. So um, what types of questions do you ask? And we'll go to Dave on this one um, to really determine if someone's a strategic thinker. Yeah, first, you know, regardless of your position, strategic and critical thinking are key components of being part of today's, you know, team environment. Um, you know, I also think being a strong agent of change and being able to show leadership are two additional traits that, again, transcend any title or, or position within an organization. So, you know, to help draw this out during an interview, uh, our questions, you know, we'll talk a, a lot about or ask them to talk a lot about projects and situations that required them to create a different approach or a new way of thinking, um, whether it be creating a new initiative, increasing results, or improving the value or success of their role or their department. Um, you know, follow up questions will be about getting them to explain what was necessary for them to determine the best approach. How do they get cross functional support or how do they deal with a challenge, you know, from a different different opinion or a different department, you know, and, and really how do they come to think about what prompted them to make those movements throughout the throughout the project. So, you know, a candidate that can easily answer that line of questioning. Uh, is someone who we can see that, you know, they really take strategic or critical, critical thinking to heart. You know, they, they really know how to work collaborative, collaboratively and um, appear to have the, the elements and the traits that we look for in our team. Well, I think that also speaks back to preparation. You know, I mean, it, it, watching things like this and also being able to say, hey, I have some things that I'm going to pull from to explain different steps in a process, which really speaks to uh, your examples there. Okay, Rob, your turn. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, demonstrating strategic proficiency is an important attribute, and it should be at different degrees based on the job level. Uh, so I would not expect like an individual contributor to have the same degree of strategic proficiency or competency as someone like who leads a business function or a department or a market. So as an individual contributor, I would simply ask them for their understanding of their department's vision and mission and to explain how their contributions really tie in to that vision and mission. However, for a person who leads a team or a business function, I would ask them to articulate you know, the collective value creation of a series of initiatives and how do they support not only the department's vision, but or more importantly, you know, the company's objectives. So I think it absolutely is important. Uh, there's many other competencies too we're not talking about, but being strategic is important. And I think that to me is also one as you get more advanced in your career, uh, it's something that you it, it, it grows on you. Um, it, it's becoming almost like a greens fee if you want to be considered for promotions. Being strategic uh, really is critical. No, this, that's great for sure. So, okay, last question in the tank for you too. Okay, so Peter Drucker has a famous quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So assuming you agree with this, how do you determine if a candidate fits well within your respective cultures? Okay, so Rob, we'll go to you on this one. I know you talked a little bit about this before, you know, being a good fit for the team, but um, do you agree that culture eats strategy for breakfast? I do, uh, but this is a really interesting question. I'm not sure I've quite figured this one out. And I've been fortunate to work for six Fortune 500 companies throughout my career. And each company has its own unique culture. But it's important to understand that a company's culture is not a one and done. It evolves and changes over time. So I'm probably not going to focus so much if the candidate is a good fit for our culture per se, but to assess if the candidate demonstrates the company's values, business acumen, morals, ethics, et cetera, which are cornerstones to a firm foundation for being a successful employee. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Dave, what about it? What does what a culture eating strategy for breakfast mean, mean at Duncan? Yeah, you know, I, I also, I agree with the importance of culture. Um, and that, you know, an individual's fit and contribution um, to our culture plays a big role in being part of the team. You know, we, we look, and Rob had mentioned this in the first question about, you know, hiring for the team. We look at gaps and weaknesses within our own current needs when we go to look for somebody that they can, you know, they can come join the team. And, and even though we can find something tactical or knowledge-based that adds value to the team, true success is really hiring that person that, that really blends in and, and, and fits with the team. Um, you know, we're fortunate enough, you know, even Rob and myself to, to represent iconic brands, you know, brands that most individuals grew up with in their childhood or have a personal experience with. And, and, and that's kind of helpful. So for me, you know, I really enjoy listening to candidates who express their passion about our brands, you know, during an interview. And, and it really shows their genuine excitement uh, and wanting to be part of our culture, you know, not just not just looking for a job, but a more important factor for me involves the questions, and Amber, you talked about this, the questions that a candidate asks me during the interview. You know, based on my role, the majority of the interviews that I take part in are really the final few. They've already gone through the process. So by the time I'm sitting there talking to a candidate, it's you know, it's not so much about their experience and their knowledge. They're given really half of the interview to ask me questions. What would they like to learn from me about the vision, the leadership, the team? And, and it's those people that can really ask great questions at that point that, that start to be the highlights and, and the, true, the true person. Amber, if I could add, um, and what David said, I think really is important as a takeaway for, for the audience. So the, to come, pre come prepared, and, and as Dave said, come prepared to ask questions. And, and in today's time, much different than when I was first starting out at an entry-level position, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have 
Well, they had cars, but anyway, they didn't have, but they, there was no social media. There was no way to be able to do a lot of research that was uh, at your fingertips. And now there's really no excuse. And so what I find to se what separates one candidate from another one that comes prepared, one that also knows a little bit about the person who's doing the interview. So from knows a little bit about me. They've done their research. They know where I went to school. They know where I was raised. They know what my interests are. I'm all over LinkedIn. It's, it's very easy to find that out. And if they can weave that into their dialogue or their responses or even into their questions, showing that they came prepared, they put a little effort into this, to me, that is, um, that's, that's important. Yeah, absolutely. So, but how much information's too much, right? So if you, you think about, uh, and we had a session on this earlier talking about um, investigations and social media, and you guys are very good at your craft. So you wonder, like, if they come in there with your wife's name and they've been on your Facebook, they know where you took your last vacation. Is that a little too creepy? Yeah, that's a little too creepy. That's a little creepy. <laughs> <laughs> so keep it professional. Do your research, but keep it professional. I would say maybe just stick to the LinkedIn information that you post. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those yeah. are fantastic tips. Uh, look, we really appreciate both of your time in this crazy time that we're living in to step into the think tank and really help give our audience uh, some tips. Because like I said in my presentation, if you're not building your network now, it's probably not a great time to start when you need it. What's that saying about when's the best time to plant a, a big oak tree? It's today. either 100 years ago or today, right? right. <laughs> so again, thank you both so much for uh, your time in the think tank, and we appreciate it. And now we're going to send it back to our sponsors, Envision and Risk Limiter by Gleason. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Amber. Thanks, David. Thank you.